Hey everyone, it's Edwin, and today we're going to be talking about some pretty heavy implications surrounding Marilyn Manson. I feel like Marilyn Manson doesn't need much of an introduction, you know? Even if you're not a fan, you might know him for his songs, you know, like, In the Dope Show. If you don't know his music, maybe you know some of his controversies, whether it's a fake one or a real one. At one time, Manson even breaks a wine bottle across his chest. Or maybe you just know him for some of his goth or eccentric looks throughout his career. But what I find interesting about his latest controversy is that it came from people on social media connecting the dots, and I mean a lot of dots, that he may have been very abusive towards one of his ex-partners. A couple years ago, the actress Evan Rachel Wood began speaking of her experience with abuse, and even though she never identified her abuser, the more she spoke, the more it sounded like she was talking about Marilyn Manson. But what made this story even more interesting is the way that Marilyn Manson responded to the controversy. Marilyn Manson abruptly ended an interview with Metal Hammer magazine after they brought up Evan Rachel Wood's name. There's an empty, black silence. Marilyn Manson, one of modern music's most articulate figures and a man who never ducks a question, has hung up. This wasn't the plan. The plan was to talk to him about his new album, We Are Chaos, and his place in the era of hashtag Me Too and cancel culture. A time when the more toxic aspects of old school rock and roll behavior increasingly won't wash. We never get as far as that. The reason? I have ventured into an area that Manson clearly does not want to engage with. It turns out that the way to silence Marilyn Manson is to say three simple words, Evan Rachel Wood. Shortly after she was brought up, he just hung up the phone. But that's not even where it ends. Shortly after the interview, Marilyn Manson's representatives were mad at the magazine and for about a month, trying to get them to pull the article until eventually deciding to issue a statement addressing their questions. We have a lot to unpack on this episode, y'all, so get ready. <laughs> Considering how much Marilyn Manson thrived from pushing the envelope as one of the most notable shock rockers back in the 90s, Metal Hammer magazine wanted to ask him about the challenges he may be facing as an artist with a present day scrutiny. I was able to get in touch with the magazine's content director and he told me that they never planned on mentioning Evan Rachel Wood in the interview, that they were actually warned not to bring her up. Throughout the interview, Marilyn Manson repeatedly went off on tangents and gave responses that weren't very relevant to the questions that were being asked. So, by the time they got to the topic of cancel culture, the interviewer eventually felt frustrated and decided to take a more direct approach. He asked Marilyn Manson what his reaction was when he heard about his ex-girlfriend, Evan Rachel Wood, say that she was in an abusive relationship when she was 18, around the time that she dated Manson, and also mentioned that people thought she was talking about him. Oof, man is brave. To which Manson replied saying, mm, This is where I headed to the photo shoot because I talk about music. I'm not here to talk about rumors. Is it not worth addressing? I understand you have to ask a question like that, but I don't want to talk about rumors as much as I want to talk about music. So, there is no truth in it? Like I said, I won't qualify it with an answer. Manson doesn't sound angry or exasperated when he says this. There's a calmness in his voice, but he's clearly not engaging with what I want to talk about. I try another question. Does he still feel like a transgressive artist? but we end up talking over each other. Nah, I'm just saying, you're not gonna get a response from that. It's only because it's not something that I'm gonna respond to, because it's off the table. So you just wanna talk about your new album? Tell me good questions about the music and we'll continue. So you only wanna talk about the new album. Now it's my turn to repeat myself. You don't wanna talk about the allegations against you? There's no allegations against me and I'm not gonna talk about it. Rumors. There's a noise like someone has put their hand over the mouthpiece of the phone. I can hear a muffled voice, then silence. I listened for a few seconds, but Marilyn Manson had gone. Damn, that was tense. Despite not showing much emotion during the interview, Manson was certainly not happy. The article goes on to say that it wasn't long before Manson's team called and asked what were they thinking bringing up Evan Rachel Wood and why a quote unquote heavy metal magazine is engaging with a topic like this. They also insisted that Manson did not hang up and the line cut off. I was told that the interview was scheduled to be for 45 minutes and that Manson hung up around the 35 minute mark. So yeah, he definitely had time to call back. But here is where it starts to get interesting. At one point, they asked the magazine if they can pull the piece and not run it. There's an implication that if it runs, it could damage future relationships between the magazine and Manson. Now, was that supposed to intimidate the magazine? Oh, you better pull the article, otherwise you might not get any more interviews from Mr. Marilyn Manson in the future. You know, technically speaking, this is actually an improvement from last time Marilyn Manson had an issue with the magazine. Back in 98, Marilyn Manson invited the executive editor for Spin Magazine to one of his concerts, only to confront him backstage and allegedly tell him that he could kill him and his entire family, and then immediately after have two of his bodyguards 
slam him up against the wall, grab him by the throat, all of this while Manson watched in approval until they let go and he said, that's what you get when you disrespect me. So theoretically speaking, it could have been a lot worse for Metal Hammer. I mean, good thing that interview was over the phone and don't accept any concert invites from Marilyn Manson. Apparently, he was mad at Spin Magazine because they had planned to have him as a cover story, but it didn't pan out, and then that happened, and then he got sued, to which Manson responded by denying the allegations and saying that it was just a conversation in which he wanted to express that Spin Magazine was very immature and he didn't want to work with them. Furthermore, Manson felt like his reputation had been stained, so he decided that he wanted to counter sue with his lawyer saying that no assault ever happened in the first place. Which is interesting because, you know, the editor, Craig Marks, definitely went to the hospital and filed police charges on the day of. And it's even more interesting when you learn that Manson didn't actually end up countersuing and it was all smoke. And Manson's own lawyer admitted that the assault did happen, but it was because Craig Marks, the editor, suddenly took his hands out of his pockets and that it only lasted two seconds. And because he took his hands out of his pockets, he was in whole or in part to blame for any injury he may have suffered. Plaintiff was engaged in an activity into which he entered knowing the hazard, risk and danger of the activity and he assumed the risks. What? The man was invited to Manson's concert, then he was invited backstage to have a conversation with Manson. Which, I guess engaging in a conversation with Manson is a hazard? Dude, what? This is weird. In the end, Manson did not counter sue, and instead settled a lawsuit with Craig Marks. But that was not the last we heard of the whole situation. Which is interesting, because even though Marilyn Manson wanted to counter sue due to his reputation being stained, he was the one that brought it up nearly two decades later in two separate interviews, one in 2016 and 2017. And the way he brought it up was even more interesting because it wasn't like he was ashamed or, or felt bad about it at all. In both interviews, he gives the same story about how he was arrested for putting a gun to the mouth of the editor for Spin Magazine and then hit at the Trump Tower. On Valentine's that Day is the February. biggest. I'm going to say that that trumps the uh, tour announcement we had a couple interviews ago. Once I got arrested for putting a gun in the mouth of the editor of Spin, and yeah. I hid out at the Trump Towers. So that trumped that. And there, were, and there was a lawsuit that was... Uh, yeah, I, that but I hid on the Trump... I hid it in the Trump Towers in New York. And also, it was on Thanksgiving, so thanks for giving me that award. Awkward as hell, dude. dude that was... Uh, yeah, I, but I hid... The Trump... I hid it in the Trump Towers. Let me just say... <laughs> The best part about you putting a gun in the mouth of a magazine editor, as many of us have wanted to do from time to time. One of us did. Um, you were a journalist. Now, even though he doesn't remember what happened quite accurately, because he wasn't arrested, he still remembers what happened, but in a much worse way, because there was never any gun to anybody's mouth. Technically speaking, the way he misremembers it should be worse for his reputation, except it isn't, because he's Marilyn Manson, a shock rocker. Therefore, by his own logic, the actual situation shouldn't have hurt his reputation, and I don't think anybody thought that either, because it's Marilyn Manson. As we crawl away from this rabbit hole, I want to bring attention to a reoccurring theme that Marilyn Manson is quite comfortable with. So don't forget the violence. Manson posted a bulletin on MySpace back in 2009 that read, I can, but do not need to defend myself on the absurd accusations that the average press has clinged onto. If we need a nude photo of me to prove that I am far different than the soon to be murdered in their home press has decided to fabricate, that is easy. But if one more journalist makes a cavalier statement about me and my band, I will personally, or my fans will help, greet them at their home and discover just how much they believe in their freedom of speech. I dare you all to write one more thing that you won't say to my face, because I will make you say it in that manner. That is a threat. Marilyn Manson. Since violence is a very prominent theme throughout Marilyn Manson's music, videos, and concerts, it's become a very gray area for people looking on the outside in, you know? They just think, oh, well, it's a shock rocker, okay, just Manson being Manson. People don't take him seriously. It's easy to say, oh, it's just his persona. It's normalized for him to say stuff like this. It's not really all that outrageous to hear him say that he put a gun to someone's mouth. Oddly enough, this works in his favor because it makes it difficult to tell what is real and what isn't. You know, he can play into the Marilyn Manson myth. The concept of the Marilyn Manson myth is that you can't tell if it's real or not. Therefore, you just assume that it probably isn't. He's just trying to shock you because he is a shock rocker after all. And you can tell he definitely plays into it considering how he freely admits so much throughout interviews. In this interview, for example, he's quoted saying, A lot of people don't realize, but with the amount of stories out there about me, there's still so much shit that I've done that they don't know about, which is a lot worse. Mainly because a lot of it is illegal and shouldn't be told. Or how about this interview when he was asked what he did to celebrate his 39th birthday? He said, yeah, I had my closest friends with me, but all the things that I did that were exciting, I can't mention until the statute of limitation passes. What? 
All right, we're out of the rabbit hole. Let's go back to the article. So at first, Manson's team turned down offers from the magazine to clarify any comments or respond to any further questions. But apparently after a month or so, they said, okay, let's talk. We have never refused to respond. You've chosen not to tell us what you're writing and it's impossible to respond to something we don't know the content of. So the magazine wrote back with 10 questions for Marilyn Manson. One. In the interview, before the call was terminated, we asked how Marilyn Manson felt on hearing Evan Rachel Wood's testimony. How did he feel? Okay, so let's get the full context behind the name that led Marilyn Manson to abruptly end the interview with Metal Hammer magazine. Evan Rachel Wood, who stars in HBO's Westworld, dated Marilyn Manson back in 2006. They got engaged in 2010, but split later that year. Their relationship alone was controversial among the public due to the 18-year difference with Evan being 18 and Manson being 36 when they first started dating. Now, wouldn't it be nice if the age gap was the most controversial part of the story? <laughs> It's about to get rough, so get ready. In 2018, Evan testified in front of Congress in support of the Sexual Assault Survivors Bill of Rights, describing her experience with sexual abuse. My experience with domestic violence was this. Toxic mental, physical, and sexual abuse which started slow but escalated over time, including threats against my life, severe gaslighting and brainwashing, waking up to the man that claimed to love me raping what he believed to be my unconscious body. Then, in April 2019, Evan testified in front of the California Senate on behalf of the Phoenix Act, a bill that proposed to extend the statute of limitations for domestic violence felonies in California created by Evan herself. And I've lived with the silence and shame for too long and it has been unbearable. It's taken years from my life because I was too afraid to tell anyone. I know that this bill will not affect my case, but I urge you to vote yes on the Phoenix Act to create a cushion for victims to leave their dangerous situations get the help they need. Although Evan Rachel Wood has not yet named her abuser, a lot of people online have heavily speculated that she was talking about Marilyn Manson. This is due to the matching timelines and the amount of correlating stories told by both Evan Rachel Wood and Marilyn Manson. 2. How does it feel to be tried by social media? He had been accused by people online of some terrible things. Would he like to take this opportunity to answer those critics and clear his name? I found this to be a pretty bad question since the magazine just says he was accused of terrible things without giving any examples. 3. Evan Rachel Wood responded to online gossip that her unnamed abuser was Mickey Rourke by tweeting, A lot of rumors have been circulating around who I was talking about in my testimony. I would like to clear something up and say, it wasn't Mickey Rourke. How did Marilyn Manson feel to read that, bearing in mind that some people online have claimed that the unnamed abuser could be him? Did he reach out to Evan and ask her to clear his name also? So despite not naming anyone, Evan has confirmed that the actor Mickey Rourke was not her abuser. However, to ask Manson if he reached out to Evan and, and said, hey, can you clear my name too? What? Is that not a weird question? Wait a second, I get it. That's a trick question because technically speaking, that's not a weird question if you're friends with someone but they're not friends, so... Hmm. After a Twitter user asked Evan Rachel Wood why she had never named her abuser, she replied, they threatened to kill me or have me killed. Back in 2009, Marilyn Manson appeared to make some lighthearted hyperbolic comments about fantasizing about smashing her skull with a sledgehammer. Does he regret making comments like that today? Okay, now this is a good question, but lighthearted hyperbolic comments? I mean, that's one way to put it. When Manson described the inspiration for his song, I Want to Kill You Like They Do in the Movies, he said that it was about his fantasies. More specifically, his fantasies about his ex-fiance, Evan Rachel Wood. I have fantasies every day about smashing her skull in with a sledgehammer. Okay then! Now the reason why that was such a good question is not just because of Evan's tweet, but also because in her testimony, she spoke about being threatened. He broke me down through means of starvation, sleep deprivation, and threats against my life, sometimes with deadly weapons. And also witnessing others being threatened. I witnessed my abuser threatening people with force or legal action if he worried they would expose him. He bragged about being able to have people killed because he was allegedly friends with multiple gangs and I watched him illegally collect data on people that he could use as blackmail. That part of her testimony where she says that her abuser is allegedly friends with people and gangs becomes a lot more interesting when you listen to Marilyn Manson describe the meaning of his song, We Know Where You Fucking Live. You know, a lot of people think it's political, but I think it was more about people saying things that they think they can get away with. And me being someone who is affiliated, let's not say affiliated, someone who is uh, friendly with uh, very dangerous people. Additionally, in a prior interview, Manson said, 
I'm not someone you want to piss off because I've got friends that are in really low places. Not saying Hells Angels, not saying MS-13 gang, not saying any of those, but I'm not somebody you fuck with. I mean, I have been arrested. I do have a lot of priors. That's the problem. But I never did prison time, which is why I started fight training this year. Because when I was doing Sons of Anarchy, I thought, you know what? If I get arrested, I don't want to be on the receiving end of what my character does. So I'll make sure I'm tough because I will probably be a hot piece of ass in jail because, you know, they might say, I'm gonna make that guy my bitch. So I wanna make sure I got my buttocks real strong and my punching fist real strong too. In the event that I get arrested, which I don't plan on doing because I like to commit crimes that are unnoticeable by the law. Aside from Evan explicitly stating that she dated her abuser at the age of 18, I was smart, but a smart 18 year old is still an 18 year old and I thought I had fell in love. This is another big indicator as to why people think that it's Marilyn Manson. And me being someone who is uh, friendly with very dangerous people and saying and say that but you know what freedom of speech does not come with a dental plan so say what you want but we know where you fucking live am i gonna be okay <laughs> five does he agree with Patricia Arquette's tweet that Marilyn Manson cutting himself 158 times when he called Evan Rachel Wood after breakup? It's not love heart emoji, it's abuse. So we have another Manson moment. You know, like, why would you say this? He described the meaning of his song, Into the Fire, to be about him hitting rock bottom back in 2008 and how he cut himself on his hands and face 158 times for each time that he called his ex fiance Evan over the phone on Christmas Day. I look back and it was a really stupid thing to do. This was intentional. This was a scarification and this was like a tattoo. I wanted to show her the pain she put me through. I was like, I want you to physically see what you've done. It sounds made up, but it's completely true and I don't give a shit if people believe it or not. I've got the scars to prove it. Shortly after Manson gave this interview, him and Evan got back together. So when you compare the timeline and his anecdote to some of what Evan says in her testimony, I mustered the courage to leave several times, but he would call my house incessantly and threaten to kill himself. Yeah, yeah, it feels familiar. Six. What does it say of our culture that when he made those comments in 2009, they were seen as Manson being controversial and outrageous, but today are questions and considered abuse? Seven. Another former girlfriend of Marilyn Manson's, Esme Bianco, also testified in front of the California Senate about an abusive past relationship she had. How does he feel about the fact that two of his ex-girlfriends have had such relationships? I would say that no matter who you are, it would definitely raise an eyebrow if two of your ex-girlfriends get together to start writing up a law to extend the statute of limitations against domestic violence, and none other than one of your former assistants is supporting them. That's right, Marilyn Manson's former assistant openly supports Marilyn Manson's ex-girlfriends who wrote a bill to extend the statute of limitations against domestic violence. I mean, yeah, you know, it's a little weird, dude. And it continues to feel suspicious when you find out that this former assistant previously tweeted out how she's also experienced multiple forms of abuse, but can't publicly speak on it without legal consequences, implying that she may have signed a non-disclosure agreement. Now, if you listen to both Evan and Esme's testimonies, you can't help but notice the similarities in the abuse that they both describe. For example, both Evan and Esme describe the abuser as charming. I had no intention of it turning into something romantic. When it eventually did, I wasn't sure how to stop it as he had a certain charisma and power and I quickly surrendered to his charms. In the beginning, he treated me like a princess. Initially, he was charming, intelligent, funny. He told me I was his soulmate. Both describe being lied to and having a sense of vulnerability to begin conveying how they were groomed. It wasn't until much later that I realized everything he had told me was a lie and part of what is called the grooming process. Before he succeeded in his seduction, my abuser carefully groomed me, manipulating and gaslighting me over a number of years of friendship. He knew that I was easy prey. They both described the abuser to use love bombing tactics and verbal ridicule as well as being extremely controlling down to how they could dress and who they could speak to. Verbal abuse and name calling was a daily occurrence. There was a certain way he wanted me to look, otherwise I would endure name calling and ridicule. He cut me off from my close friends and family one by one by exhibiting rage in some form or another when I was in contact with them. By the time I was living with him, he controlled every aspect of my life. 
He had a dress code I was expected to abide by. He controlled what I ate, decided if my friendships were acceptable, and when I called my family, I did, I did so hiding inside a closet. They both mentioned sleep deprivation. He broke me down through means of starvation, sleep deprivation, and threats against my life. He controlled when and if I slept, and I was often violently shaken awake should I go to sleep without permission. And both say that all these acts could lead to further abuse. Sometimes he would not allow me to sleep until I participated in acts of fear, pain, torture, and humiliation, which I felt powerless to stop. But the physical violence was most often disguised in acts of intimacy and was not consented to. In one instance, I was bitten until my body was covered in bruises, on another occasion cut with a knife during sex. Both also mentioned that the abuser would wreck the home. He had bouts of extreme jealousy, which would often result in him wrecking our home, cornering me in a room and threatening me. He started smashing holes in the walls with an axe, and as I tried to calm him down, he began to chase after me with a weapon. And lastly, they both mentioned their abuse being recorded. He also threatened to leak parts of the footage or photographs he had taken as a way to keep me quiet. He took photos of my naked, mutilated body and posted them online without my knowledge. 8. Another of Manson's former partners, Rose McGowan, had been at the forefront of the hashtag MeToo movement, with at least three of his ex-partners claiming to have suffered abuse at the hands of men, who then intimidated them into silence. Does he stand in support of them? 9. It's possible to interpret lyrics on the song Perfume on his new album as being about victim culture. The song seems to suggest that some victims relish their victimhood and do it for fame. Is that how he feels? 10. The song could even be considered threatening to someone who is claiming victimhood. In your hair will be brains. What is the song Perfume about? Yeah. Okay, now that we have all the questions and all the context, let's see how Manson's team responded. We've advised our client to not comment further on your article. Personal testimony is just that, and we think it's inappropriate to comment on that. Well, that's one way to say Marilyn Manson is not on good terms with his former partners. Can't even support their testimonies? You then go on to talk about Marilyn being accused of terrible things by unnamed critics, but offer no guidance on who those critics are and what these things are, so it's not possible to comment. I mean, yeah, they got a point there. You then mention Mickey Rourke. It's my understanding that even Rachel Wood dated multiple people around the time she was dating Manson. Basic internet research will give you a host of other names that have not come up in any of our discussions. So earlier, I mentioned that I thought it was a weird question to ask if Manson requested for Evan to clear his name too. To me, it comes off borderline accusatory. Yet, Manson's team entertained the question anyway. And they did it terribly, which is a damn shame because they could have just ignored it. But damn, they're really digging themselves a hole. I mean, at face value, if you don't know much of the context, it might make sense to say, hey, w what about all the other guys she dated, huh? Basic internet research will show you that she dated all these men. But it's just not true. You see, the thing is, basic internet research will show that 18-year-old Evan Rachel Wood only dated Marilyn Manson and Jamie Bell. Furthermore, Jamie Bell is a pretty easy scratch-off as far as being her abuser for a number of reasons. After breaking things off with Manson, Evan and Jamie rekindled their relationship and got married in 2012 and also had a son the following year. Even though they split in 2014, she's only spoken positively about him and remains close friends with him to this day. Not only that, but in an interview with Bustle, she mentions that she repressed her trauma for so many years that she barely discussed it with her husband at the time, Jamie Bell. When you look at that, Marilyn Manson's team has me doing all this basic internet research that they probably didn't expect the average reader to do, and it's looking like it's not really working in their favor. We still got more to go though, so sit tight. Your next couple of posts deal with comments made about Manson in Spin Magazine in 2009. Your confusion around this timeline of this is extremely worrying. Editor's note. There's no confusion around this timeline. The comments in Spin where Manson had a fantasy of using a sledgehammer on Evan and he cut himself 158 times was obviously a theatrical rock star interview promoting a new record and not a factual account. The fact that Evan and Manson got engaged six months after this interview would indicate that no one took this story literally. Huh, is that so? I mean, Manson said he's got the scars to prove it if we don't believe him. Let's do an inspection. But okay, you see what's happening here? They're literally playing into the Manson myth, where they blur the line between reality and theatrics. I mean, it's like the representative says, they ended up getting engaged afterwards, so who cares, right? 
nothing bad could have happened if they ended up getting engaged after he said such horrific things that ends up lining up with what Evan said. You go on to talk about Manson commenting on sexual harassment, Me Too, and specifically the experiences of his ex-partner, Rose McGowan. These are all issues that Manson has publicly addressed and are available online. Please see Channel 4 interview from the 15th of December, 2017. I just don't want to see this turn uh, Hollywood into something that takes away from films being made. And, and that's not to disrespect the people that are saying these allegations. I just think that if you have something to say, you should say it to the police, not to the press, and handle it that way first and foremost. And that's what I would do. Yes, Manson's team really directed us to an interview in which Manson says nothing positive about the Me Too movement and instead says he's afraid that allegations could take away from the entertainment. You know, the things that happened to me growing up as a kid is nothing that I'm going to talk about or complain about. I mean, I, I am guilty as charged when it comes to writing a book and talking about my childhood, but I'm not trying to make it into a crazed thing where I can't turn on my phone every day without someone being accused of something. Not only that, but he also speaks the narrative that goes directly against Rose's narrative. And maybe it's all men are bad, or all men can't do anything inappropriate. You know, it makes you feel like you can't even like say, like I meet her and say, if I could look at her the wrong way, I'm gonna be accused of something wrong. I just think, I think that's such a, a really insipid argument because it's the end of flirting. I'm sorry, I've flirted with people, but you know when you're at the store, right? And there's the candy bin, and it's like the bulk candy bin, and you're like, <laughs> you know when you're doing that. You know when you're taking that, and you're not supposed to. You know, and there's a difference between like enjoying your candy, consensually buying your candy, you know, or like consensually being with somebody. All of this while saying that he's not trying to disrespect Rose and he doesn't disagree with what she's doing. And I, and I, and I don't disagree with, you know, when you're speaking about my ex fiance, I don't disagree with how she's handling it. I just disagree with the, the entire snowball effect that's happened with it that it could really ruin a lot of things that are, it could ruin a lot of people's lives that don't need to be ruined. So basically, speak your truth, but don't ruin careers. Not only does this response from Manson's team make him look terribly, it also doesn't really answer the question they were asked in the first place because the Me Too movement did originate from sexual harassment in the workplace. And as the question emphasizes, they're asking him about his stance on three of his former partners who claim to have suffered abuse at the hands of men who intimidated them into silence. The question was simple, does he stand in support of them? He couldn't answer it for Rose three years ago and he can't answer it now for the other two ladies, who by by the way have also mentioned in their testimonies that it's too late for them to go to the police which is a big reason why they're testifying in the first place to extend the statute of limitations against the kind of abuse that they endured manson has never shied away from public comment equally he does not have to make the same comment twice oh king of the castle never shied away from public comment huh well i guess there's always time for a first Mr. Shy Manson. It's also worth noting that back in April, Loudwire reached out to Manson's representatives regarding Evan Rachel Wood and said that their message was received, but Loudwire didn't receive a statement back from Manson. There will be no further comment on specific songs. Your journalist had the opportunity to ask Manson about his music, one of only two interviews granted in the UK, and he chose not to. Trying to weave one section of one song from an artist with a 30 plus year career to fit a narrative is both disingenuous and troublesome. One of two interviews interviews granted in the UK and Metal Hammer fudged it up. Y'all had the king of the castle at your fingertips and y'all messed it up by bringing up Evan, man. Jane. You mentioned Manson's ex fiance Rose McGowan, in your question. Rose is one of the bravest and most outspoken figureheads of the Me Too movement. Manson remains friends with McGowan, and she talks very fondly of their three and a half years together. There are multiple sources worldwide, including her memoir, Brave. Metal Hammer only mentioned Rose once, but it seems as if Manson's PR team wanted to capitalize on the fact that she spoke fondly of him in the past and that she's monumental within the Me Too movement. Almost as if she's the trophy to take him out of the possibility that he could be abusive. Well, that did not sit well with Miss Rose McGowan. She posted a screenshot of a text message that she sent to Marilyn Manson on her Instagram story and her caption read, I am so sorry you were hurt by anyone. Sent a message to Marilyn Manson. Hey, I don't know what happened with you and Evan, but tell your reps I am not to be used as a shield. 
Not now, not ever. If Evan names you or anyone else, I will support her, regardless of my history with you. I hope it's not you, but I have no idea. Do not use the fact that you texted with me recently after many years as a way out. Do not use my book Brave, where I wrote about good times with you as a defense. I will allow no one to use me. Wow, that backfired terribly. She just invalidated everything from that response. From don't use examples from my book to defend yourself, to don't think that just because you texted with me recently after not talking for literally years that we're good friends, which almost sounds strategic, all the way to if Evan says your name, I will stand by her side. Oof. Man, I'm starting to wonder if that representative got fired. You failed to mention Manson's ex-wife, Dita Von Tees, who remains good friends with Manson. Quoting from a Female First article published in 2018, Dita admits she has been lucky to avoid any abusive episodes in the entertainment industry in her career. Trophy number two. Definitely a quote that leaves out suspicion of any abuse within his relationship with Dita. Which is great, because that same website published an article in the past about Dita titled Dita Von Tees Abusive Marriage Insinuations. This article quoted an interview with her shortly after they ended their relationship, and Dita Von Tees said that she would like her next partner to be more even-tempered and have good manners. More specifically, someone who doesn't break all the windows in the house. Huh, that sounds familiar. In the rest of the interview conducted by The Guardian, she goes on to say, I've never been that girl out looking for a rich husband. I never wanted to have anyone say what I can or can't do. My soon-to-be ex-husband, rock star Marilyn Manson, asked me to quit my work so he could support me. I quickly realized that he wanted to change me. Damn, that's also sounding really fucking familiar. <laughs> I never took him for someone who would exploit our divorce for the sake of records. I don't think people realize he used our marriage bed in that music video to have sex with that girl. Manson's new girlfriend, Evan Rachel Wood. And he wore his wedding ring. I just thought, wow, this is kind of obsessive. I guess I still matter. In no way am I trying to imply that Manson was abusive towards Dita. The reason I'm bringing it up is to show the similarities between Manson and this uh, mysterious abuser these two women describe. You know, with having a bad temper, breaking stuff, saying what Dita can and can't do, and most interestingly, wanting to change her. There are also numerous articles over multiple years where even Rachel Wood speaks very positively about her relationship with Manson. I wouldn't trade any of our relationship, Wood told the magazine. I appreciate everything he taught me. I don't think we're right for each other. That specific quote was from 2015, and there are no instances of Evan speaking positively of Manson in 2017 or beyond. Which, you know, if we follow her timeline, she said that it took her around seven years to really fully process and understand what had happened to her. Finally, you talk about death threats. Manson knows all about those. He has had many. He has spent his career being blamed for everything from Columbine to teenage suicide. But those aren't the types of threats that Evan Rachel Wood is talking about. She's talking about being threatened by her abuser. Only what? Are you really out here reaching for sympathy for your mans, Marilyn Manson? Unfortunately, we live in a time where people believe what they read on the internet and feel free to say what they want with no actual evidence. The effects can be catastrophic and promoting non-fact-based information is wholly irresponsible. All we can try to do as the media and individuals is to use facts and truth and not hide behind gossip and conjecture to further our own agendas. And yes, people are free to say what they want on the internet and I do agree. They should be more responsible with their words. However, in this particular case, c come on, man. There are so many similarities of everything being speculated. I mean, the women said that the abuser took pictures and videos of them naked and, and tortured them. Esme saying without her consent. And what do you know? Marilyn Manson has literally posted pictures of both of these ladies naked. And although we can't tell exactly what's going on in some of these photos, some of them do include a whole lot of blood and were posted on Marilyn Manson's website as well as his MySpace page. Furthermore, Marilyn Manson's website used to have a video intro of what appears to be him punching Evan in the face as she sits tied up bleeding. I gotta say, I think it's kind of cute that the self-declared Antichrist superstar who stood behind a podium at the MTV Video Music Awards We will no longer be oppressed by the fascism of Christianity now hides behind his PR who basically says now look, don't, don't believe everything you see online. Sometimes when it looks like a duck, swims like a duck, and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. Unless that duck's name is Marilyn Manson. Now this isn't to say that he's a culprit of these actions that these women are talking about, but it sure as hell sounds like they're talking about him. You know, the next step would be to prove those actions. I just find it bizarre to even entertain the theory of was it Manson by saying, well, you know, it could have been these other people, right? Like, what kind of response is that? Why not just categorically shut down the idea of the abuser being Manson 
if it's all just rumors you know I, I think it's weird that his team entertained the entire thing in the first place they should just said no it's not him Mansa could have done it in the interview and his representative could have done it in the follow-up I think when there's this much circumstantial evidence pointing that hey it could be you then at the very least you could give a more direct response than dancing around it you know because here's the thing even though earlier in this video i said that the whole manson myth works in his favor and it has for many other instances i think in this instance to, to kind of add on to the speculation it makes him look bad intentionally or not manson has left more room for speculation on a matter that the average person would shut down in disgust i mean if i was accused of these things i would be like what the fuck? no fuck that dude hell no you know <laughs> not to mention i was somewhat familiar with the story i had seen these testimonies earlier this year but if I was to cover in the video, it would feel like I'm just doing a theory, right? But now this theory, I believe it has a lot more substance with these ridiculous responses. <laughs> it's also worth noting that following the publishing of the article, the ex-wife of Manson's former bassist, Twiggy Ramirez, shared a photo of herself tagging Evan on her Instagram story and followed with a screenshot of a headline about the response from Manson's team. She captioned it saying, I never spoke on this before, but I was there for eight years. I don't like him. Separating art from the artist does not work for me. In an interview with Apple Music earlier this year, Marilyn Manson talked about today's culture and he had something that I found to be quite interesting to say. It's a different culture and a different scenario that we're, that we're stuck with. So we deal with it. And that's a way that real strong people deal with things. They face the problem and they either conquer it or they suffer from it. Manson, it's like you said, you either face a problem and conquer it or you suffer from it. It's, it's never easy to be in a position where you don't have any control. That's the worst possible thing. It's never easy to be in a position where you don't have any control. I, I'm just gonna go ahead and, and assume that he doesn't feel like he has any control over the situation. I mean, what a mess this entire situation has been for him. Guys, if you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. Oh my God, I can't believe it. It's done. I don't want to get too ahead of myself because this video alone was so difficult to organize because there was just so much information that I try to pack into one video, right? And I assure you there is just so much more. So make sure you subscribe because this might just turn into a series. I want to give a very warm thank you and happy holidays to my boys, Nick and John, for helping me out in this video and doing some of the narration. I feel like it really added to the, the, the storytelling of it, you know? my girlfriend too. But seriously, check out their channels. They make great content. Happy holidays to my subscribers too. If you're not subscribed, then neutral holidays. You guys ever listen to corn? I love corn.